tonight from pageantry to politics here in London. Even with Theresa May standing at his side, Donald Trump weighs in on her replacement. What made you come out here today? What Trump is doing to the world? Why there's little diplomatic immunity for Trump on London streets. I just in the no-fly list. She fell victim to an online scam. So why did Air Canada ban her from flying and demand she pay up? You're just wasting your time making great food for very little profit. And your online food orders are pushing restaurants to the brink. So they've come up with an answer. Ghost Kitchen. This is the national. We're here again in London tonight where the U.S. president continues his official state visit. The famous mall lined with the shared national colors of these two countries. But the mood elsewhere in this city not nearly as uniform over just how to receive Donald Trump. The timing made especially awkward given the political climate. Behind me, of course, number 10 Downing Street, the official address of the British Prime Minister. The current occupant won't be there for much longer because the clock is ticking down on Theresa May's tenure. But even so, she had to put on a brave face for day two of Trump's state visit. Less pomp, more political circumstance. The president and prime minister covered much ground on Iran, climate change, and the Chinese tech giant Huawei. And while they still don't quite see eye to eye on those issues, Trump, who has been harshly critical of May, struck a surprisingly warm tone. I have greatly enjoyed working with you. You are a tremendous professional. Of course, not a tremendous amount of public warmth for Trump himself, with protesters out in force. Donald Trump! We spent the day speaking with some of them. But let's start with the politics of the day. Now, while Theresa May and Donald Trump are not close, the countries they lead certainly are. And as Margaret Evans explains, whoever moves into the address behind me will have to contend with a president who has considerable sway in this country. The British Prime Minister's long goodbye has begun. And as fate would have it, it comes at the side of the U.S. leader she invited, but who has not always proven her admirer. Theresa May has already morphed into the role of spectator, a bystander in her own exit. It is the House of Trump the cameras have come to see. And at a joint press conference, the talk was of who will replace her. So I know Boris. Uh, I like him. I've liked him for a long time. He's, uh, I think, he'd do a very good job. It's not the first time Donald Trump has waded into British politics, a fan of Brexit. Today, perhaps in a concession to May's departure, he muted his criticism of her ability to achieve it. She's probably a better negotiator than I am. Perhaps you won't be given the credit that you deserve if they do something, but I think you deserve a lot of credit. Protesters who want to remain in the European Union say Trump has no business in their affairs of state. But May's successor and so Britain's next prime minister will be chosen by the Conservative Party. And the candidates so far all favor Brexit. And if Britain does leave Europe after decades of close political and economic ties, say analysts, it will need the United States to help fill the inevitable vacuum. When the Conservative um, leaders in, uh, in Parliament and the membership more broadly are thinking about their next leader, that's not an insignificant thing for the president to weigh in on. Trump also made time for Mr. Brexit himself, Nigel Farage, not a conservative, but a thorn in Theresa May's side and potentially those of her would-be successors. It all managed to make the so-called special relationship feel a little one-sided. It is a time of extreme crisis in Britain, but protests or not, for the past few days anyway, the U.S. president has been the one setting the agenda. So, Margaret, it's one thing to watch a news conference like that on television, something else entirely to be in the room. What, what struck you? 
Um, it was really, really tense to begin with, and that was partly because everybody was wondering whether Donald Trump was going to grab Theresa May's arm or they were going to hold hands or something like that, but also because he had his entire family sitting in the front row, and it sort of felt like he was receiving an award. Um, but the mood shifted, and, um, and Theresa May at a certain times looked like she was afraid of what he was going to say, but he was actually pretty gracious, as I was saying in the piece, and then, you know, then he went full-on Trump sometimes, and the sky's the limit, you know. There's a free trade deal coming for Britain if and when it leaves uh, the European Union, and the sooner the better, according to Trump. So, um, you know, take your pick, but much more cordial than people thought that it would be. All right, Myra, thanks very much. It's a pleasure. Donald Trump, the welcome man. Now, many Brits don't want Donald Trump in the country. He is one of the least popular U.S. presidents here in decades. But while thousands of protesters have been on the streets since his arrival, they don't seem to have the steam they once did. He's back, and yes, that's his convoy, so naturally, it's back. The Trump baby, now a British protest staple. As are the handmaids. They've leapt from the minds of Margaret Atwood to any streets where there's a worry about women's rights. So it's either a function of the way the British protest or the men they're protesting, that there are so many disparate issues they've had to divide themselves into little clusters. There is a climate block, a women's rights block, a migrants' rights block, an anti-racism block, and I'm not kidding, there is even a chlorinated chickens block. The result, a cacophonous mashup, some issues decades old. The chlorinated chicken block, though, not hard to spot. If we do a trade deal with the US, they've got lower food standards, which includes chlorinating chicken, which is not allowed in the EU, and we don't want it here either. The rage that brought out 250,000 people for Trump's visit last year did not draw them this time. People thought they'd won last year. So uh, when they brought him again, I think people were dispirited. The fury didn't fizzle from Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn. He shunned official events, even dinner with the Queen, and opted instead to address the protesters. So I say to our visitors that have arrived this week, think on, please, about a world that defeats the religious hatreds that are being fueled by the far right in politics in Britain, in Europe and the United States. However impassioned, Corbyn still wants to be Prime Minister. If it happens, how would he deal with a President Trump who might not forgive him? Well, I know why you don't like Trump. Seated in the crowd, a few Trump supporters, some primed for a fight. And so, inevitable scuffles, nothing serious and really nothing new. Well, not for the humans, anyway. I'm going in for it. I'm going to pop the bloody thing. <laughs> this self-described Trump supporter recording herself popping the Trump baby balloon. Did it. And that's the day deflated. And stay with us for more from London tonight. It is a big week here for another reason, too. Thursday is the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Later, Canadian veterans share their experiences with a whole new generation to help make sure that sacrifice will not be forgotten. For now, though, let's head back to Canada. Yeah, now that we have the final report on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, people are looking for action. Now, one idea at the table is the creation of a police task force that might go back and crack all of those unsolved cases. But those answers may be very hard to come by. Olivia Stefanovic explores why. Tamara is my, my niece, and she was also a young mother of one. And Tamara Lynn Chipman disappeared in 2005. Her aunt Gladys Radek keeps a photo on her car, a car that tells so many stories of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. When she went missing, the, the, uh, I started talking to other family members, and uh, we realized that there were so many more Tamaras. Radek was one of the first people to call for a national inquiry. Now that it's over, she wants action. We need to now hold their feet to the fire. The final report calls for a national police task force. The purpose of that task force would be to give families and survivors the answers that they want. Reviewing thousands of unsolved cases would need significant resources, and the federal government is not committing funding yet. But some police forces aren't waiting. It's so important to us to uh, 
uh, be able to provide whatever answers we can t to those families um, and just to work with them and try and reestablish uh, those relationships. The Ontario Provincial Police has a unit specifically for these reopened cases, though none have been solved yet. And some say doing that work on a national scale presents challenges. If the hope is that there's going to be a host of new charges being laid and a host of uh, convictions coming out of this, I suspect this is not going to be the case. Um, and so families will be disappointed. For one, investigators are limited by the evidence originally gathered. Family members say they want police to at least try. We're all suffering that same pain of the loss of a loved one. And if we can get answers for these families, that would be great. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Gatineau, Quebec. Now, as Canada acknowledges its past, China is taking the opposite approach. Today marks 30 years since the Tiananmen Square massacre. The country continues to suppress any mention of it, and it especially didn't like what Justin Trudeau had to say about it. We have real concerns about uh, China's behavior in regards to human rights, and we'll continue to advocate both directly with Chinese leadership, as I have every time I have sat down with them, uh, and uh, indirectly uh, with our allies uh, call for uh, better respect of human rights on this uh, anniversary and every day going forward. China calls this flagrant interference in the country's internal affairs. And things are tense right now between Canada and China. Have a look. These two Canadians, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, they're being detained in China, accused of espionage. Just one example. But on the Tiananmen Square massacre itself, mainland China was silent. No events marking the anniversary. In Hong Kong, on the other hand, huge crowds. And that's where the CBC's Sasha Petrasik is tonight. Candlelight filled Hong Kong's Victoria Park tonight as tens of thousands came to do what no one in the rest of China is allowed, to mark the 30th anniversary of the Tiananmen Massacre the day when the Chinese army shot student protesters on the streets of Beijing. Hundreds and perhaps thousands died. I think the most important thing is tell the Chinese government that we don't forget, and they must be get the responsibility for what they do. That sort of message isn't allowed in mainland China, as Beijing has spent the past three decades trying to erase all memory of its crackdown. The 1989 protests saw more than a million Chinese students and workers fill Tiananmen Square in the middle of Beijing, demanding democracy. After a seven-week standoff, government hardliners prevailed in China's divided leadership, sending in tanks and troops. <laughs> Wang Dan was one of the main student leaders. I have to admit that we were naive 30 years ago because we still have hope for the Chinese Communist Party. That's why we went to the street. We hope and we believe, maybe we believe the Chinese Communist Party will do some political reform. The party had no intention of doing it then and no regrets now. In a rare comment on the crackdown, China's Minister of Defense insisted it was the correct move. That was political turmoil the central government needed to suppress, says Wei Fenghe. Because of that, China's enjoyed stability and development, he says. People from Hong Kong who are here are definitely showing their support for the Chinese mainland, but there's more to it than that. They're also worried about their own democratic rights, especially the right to free speech. Ever since this place stopped being a British colony, China's been chipping away at basic rights. We see the, the nature of the Communist Party. All these are lie, and actually I can see the Communist Party also don't trust Hong Kong people. They are afraid of the democracy. China's response to the Tiananmen protests showed that, but the rows of people holding candles and regularly protesting on the streets here shows Hong Kong won't give up its freedoms in silence. Sasha Petrasek, CBC News, Hong Kong. A young woman is calling out Air Canada for banning her from its flights. Her trouble began when she fell for an online scam that is so common it costs the industry a billion dollars a year. She didn't break any law but says she's being treated like a criminal. Eric Rankin has her story. 
25-year-old Anne Chian thought she'd found a bargain online. A homesick Ontario college student, she wanted cheap flights to visit her sister in Vancouver and her parents in Shanghai. So she went on WeChat, the Chinese messaging app, and saw an ad by user Captain Cool, offering Air Canada tickets up to 50% off. Last year, she took three round trips from Toronto's Pearson Airport without a problem and prepaid for two more flights. I trust him. I pay the money. But when Anne came to the airport to catch her fourth flight in just over a year, she was in for a big shock. Air Canada said her electronic ticket was no good. The only thing that took off that day was her nightmare. They just say I'm on no fly list. I'm so shocked why I'm on that list. Air Canada then sent her a demand letter telling Anne she's banned from flying with them until she pays more than $18,600. Turns out Captain Cool had been buying tickets with a stolen credit card. He disappeared along with the thousands Anne paid for her two outstanding flights. When she tried to have her travel ban lifted, saying she was a victim too, Air Canada said her failure to verify she was dealing with an accredited travel agent was akin to buying a television set in a bar. It's unjustified, it's unreasonable, and there's simply put, there's just not grounds for their actions, right? Air passenger rights activist Gabor Lukacs agrees. It took Air Canada more than a year to detect the fraud. So how can they possibly expect the customer to know it right away? The case is now headed to the Canadian Transportation Board for arbitration. Chian feels victimized twice. I don't know how to figure it out and start crying a lot. Eric Rankin, CBC News, Vancouver. Business owners in St. John's are also feeling put out today. A campaign to fight crime has backfired because it's so mysterious it is potentially frightening. Chris O'Neill Yates shows us why it's not working. The posters appeared overnight on buildings in passageways, posted anonymously and bearing ominous messages. On the very corner that you're standing on, you know, at 11.30 at night is a sign that basically says you're in an unsafe place. One says the time was 8.22 p.m. He was hanging around the stairwell wearing a jean jacket. He assaulted that woman. Another, the time was 5.51. He walked in the store wearing a grey hoodie. He held up the place at gunpoint. It's like putting up a beware of dog sign. You know, you're kind of looking, you know, where's the dog? So it gives that feeling and that illusion that downtown isn't safe. The posters are part of a campaign by Crime Stoppers to let people know they can give anonymous tips, but businesses fear they will scare people away. There's enough people that already already say, you know, I don't go downtown because you can't park and blah. Now they're going to say I can't go downtown because people are getting mugged and people are doing crack. James Dean, visiting from Toronto, got that impression. Well, obviously as a tourist, it looks like it's a threatening area. You shouldn't come here, stay away. We don't agree with the messaging. City Council voted to let the posters go up, but the deputy mayor says it doesn't control the content. That's, that's, uh, that's a freedom of speech issue. In an email statement today, Crime Stoppers says the campaign was never created as a commentary on the amount of crime or to spark fear, but to let people know their tips are 100% anonymous. They say they expected a reaction and dialogue. Everybody's talking about it. Um, I just don't think it worked in a way that people will feel supportive of Crime Stoppers now. I think they're a little angry. Despite the outcry, these posters will appear around the city for three more weeks. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, St. John's. Okay, still ahead, we visit the California school where Kawhi Leonard has always been king of the court. Plus the growing number of restaurants with no tables, no wait staff, the rise of the ghost kitchen. I call real estate agents, I ask them for the worst location in the city with the cheapest rent because I don't need a storefront, I don't open the customers. Why your takeout may be coming from one of them. A new trendy dinner establishment is opening in Montreal next week, but no one will be eating there. Call it a ghost kitchen, created only to fill the growing number of orders from food delivery apps. That might sound like good news for the industry, but as Diane Buckner explains, it is pushing many restaurants to the brink. So this is Uber, this is Skip the Dishes, this is DoorDash, this is Fedora. So we George Cottas runs a virtual food court. This is a chicken wing concept. This is a Philly cheesesteak concept. 
a wrap concept, a poutinery, burrito concept. So we have 14 different menus, 14 different restaurants, 14 different brands. To a hungry smartphone user, it looks like they're choosing from any one of Cottis's 14 different restaurants. But this single so-called ghost kitchen in suburban Toronto is churning out the food for all the brands he runs. He operates ghost kitchens in Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg, Saskatoon and more. None with a dining room. I call real estate agents I ask them for the worst location in the city with the cheapest rent because I don't need a storefront. I don't open the customers. Canadians ordered a billion dollars worth of meals with their smartphones last year and the trend is still growing. It's estimated that already there are 50 ghost kitchens across the country. Delivering food to people too busy or too tired to cook. The work in construction all day and then treating yourself after is just, I feel like, you know, it's just a treat I could treat myself with. This is our um, halibut with french fries and a, a, a tartar sauce. And John Lettieri has another take on the ghost kitchen concept. He owns Hero Burger, an Ontario-based chain of 52 restaurants. He's trying to market his meals to other restaurants across the country for them to sell through the apps. I believe it's an opportunity to help independent restaurants grow their business. It's an opportunity for us to grow our business. All right, guys, one gluten-free noodle up. But not every restaurant owner is on board the trend. The delivery apps charge a hefty 30% commission on every order. My profit margins are so tiny that if I give that, I can give upwards of 30% to those third-party apps, and it's gone like that. You're just wasting your time making great food for very little profit, so. At Foodora, the managing director says apps like his need to take 30% to stay in business. It's actually what we have to charge to make our business work. Us, as well as the restaurant, we're actually operating on very, very thin margins. George Cottas thinks 30% is fair. The apps handle everything from photography to marketing to delivery. He has big expansion plans and doesn't think he's hurting regular restaurants. People still want to go out and eat. They want to go to sit-down restaurants, their favorite restaurants. It's just an extra option for them. He does believe, though, that more change is coming and dining establishments will need to adjust or else. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. After the break, it's back here to London as the countries that fought in the Second World War prepare to mark the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Some conversations between the young and some vets who will never forget what they did when they were young. There's an 84 year difference between us. I'm 14 years old, yeah. a grade nine student, and I'm getting to interview you at the age of 98. And I understand you played a role at Juno Beach on D-Day. I never did anything special on D-Day. I just followed orders like everybody else. <laughs> On this night, 75 years ago, about 150,000 Allied troops were poised to make history. They were two days away from being ordered to take the beaches of Normandy and push on into Nazi territory. Among them, 14,000 Canadians. Now, time is stealing those men from us, making their stories all the more important to hear. For young people now, teenagers, the Second World War is history class material. But for the soldiers who were there on June 6, 1944, some of them, just teenagers then too, it was real life. So we thought we'd ask the young to talk with these men about being young. The National teamed up with CBC Kids News, whose correspondents met up with three D-Day veterans for honest conversations that erased the generations dividing them. I just want to, like, understand what it was like to actually be there. Wow, he served in so many places. This is uh, Lloyd Thomas Bentley. He's actually 98 years old. Wow, 98? Yeah, he yes. served in the Royal Air Force Transport Command. He flew planes um, on D-Day across Juno Beach with paratroopers and supplies. Wow. I, uh, I'm going to interview Colin Brown. He was uh, born in Ancaster, and uh, I live in Hamilton, a few minutes away, which is pretty cool. And uh, he fought 
on Gold Beach in D-Day, and they marched into Normandy, France. I find that really brave. Yeah, I'm gonna interview this Alex Pollowin. He was in the Canadian Navy. His ship was protecting the ships that were helping troops off onto the beaches on D-Day. He's also got lots of different awards. I'm hoping to get some personal stories. Like, I want it as if, like, from one 13-year-old to a veteran, right? You know, like, <laughs> tell me stories. I want to hear them. It's like talking with a time traveler. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I wonder how those experiences have shaped them and the opportunity to talk to real veterans who have gone through yeah. these experiences is something so special. I was born right here in Ancaster. I was going to high school when World War II started. That was a way of life. Everybody joined something. So, Arjun, you excited about today? Oh, I'm so excited, you know, to meet, actually, my first veteran. It's going to be awesome. He's going to have a lot of stuff to share, and um, it's going to be interesting to hear what he's going to say. When I think of all the soldiers fighting on D-Day, I think of sacrifice, of course. Hi, Mr. Brown. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. When I interview my vet, I really hope to get some personal stories, because it's not every day you get to interview a veteran from World War II. We can lock him out. <laughs> so I've seen film of soldiers approaching the coasts of northern France, and, you know, I, I can't imagine how it must have been, you know, to be in that situation you know, with planes everywhere and, you know, people are screaming, shouting, everybody's going crazy. And uh, how were the landings like for you? Well, <laughs> just as we were going to get from the, a Canadian ship called the Prince David down to a smaller boat so we can get closer to the beach, the driver of the boat didn't seem to realize that there was a floating dock but there was part when it went underwater. He drove his, our boat across that and we got stuck sitting there. And you know what? We had to wait till the tide changed. Well, that isn't very comfortable because you can't do anything sitting yeah. on that little boat, mass of people. Uh, was it scary for you? Like what, what, what was going Not on? Not really. Not really? Um, there's so much going on, you immediately feel I'm such a small individual. They can't be just coming to kill me. Yeah. They kill that guy over there someplace, but they're not going to kill me. Did you ever get hurt while fighting during D-Day? I think we had a total of 14 Canadians in my unit. Yeah. And I was the only one who wasn't wounded. Oh, wow. This is the song that got them into the wartime spirit. It brought a little bit of light, you know, the, anything is good. Hello. Hiya. Hi. How, how you doing? Good, good. Nice to meet you. A pleasure. So, how was D-Day? What was, what was it like? Were you afraid? You know, like when D-Day came around by then, I had a lot of experience already that I, ex you know, the fear of getting killed then wasn't as great then as it might have been because we were in a lot of combat before D-Day. So it was just a job, that a dangerous job. So out at sea, uh, did you have any encounters with uh, enemy ships? We, we did, yeah, we, we did. We torpedoed a Dutch destroyer that the Nazis captured. The ship is on fire, and oil comes out, comes out on the water, and people dive into the water, and the water is on fire, and it's a very, very horrible scene. I, I know I cried when I saw that. It was like uh, I couldn't believe that I, that I went through that. I didn't dream I'd ever go through anything like that. I, I figured I'd never make good soldiers, so I joined the Air Force. And all my friends joined, and uh, out of about 45, it was only three or four of us got back. Hi, Mr. Bentley. Uh, hi, how are you keeping? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sara, nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just thinking in the car over here, 
there's an 84 year difference between us. I'm 14 years old, yeah. a grade nine student, and I understand you played a role at Juno Beach on D-Day. I never did anything special on D-Day. I just followed orders like everybody else. <laughs> and on uh, June the 6th at supper time, six o'clock, we towed a glider in which landed on the the east side of a bridge over the Sword Beach. That was an amazing sight to see everything. And the planes were all different heights, four or five different levels of planes. And there was 13,000 aircraft took part. And I think I could see about two or 3,000 aircraft at one time. And the ships down below were so thick, it was five to 7,000. I swear if I stepped out, if I had long legs, I could walk back to England on the ship. <laughs> What was your most vivid memory throughout everything, maybe specific to D-Day? Well, I'll never forget the first group of wounded we flew back, and they'd sort them out into the different wounds, like belly wounds, uh, face wounds, or arms and legs missing. But that first plane load uh, wounded we brought back, I walked into the plane, it was a hot Normandy summer day, and the smell was something so terrific from all these wounded people, and from that day on, nothing nothing shocked me after that. That's the most unforgettable thing I, I've ever seen in my life. Wow. From the Navy is Alex Pollan. After the war, obviously, you, you're very happy. It was peace. Uh, Extremely happy. You know, there's two sides to a coin, and it's it's like that. You have to say goodbye to your friends and, uh, you know, everybody that was in combat. And when it's over, how are you supposed to think and feel? Are you ready to take a job on? You've got no training. Are you ready to go back to school? Maybe yes, maybe no. Yeah. And it's very, very, very frightening. That's your biggest enemy at the time, maybe just as big as the war. What are you gonna do for the rest of your life? But I'm very happy with the life I've lived. With your Jewish heritage, how was it in the war? How was it to, to forgive after, after all Jewish people have gone through? Uh, it's, at times it was very, very painful, but mm -hmm. I don't have no malice in me at all. I, I've forgiven our enemy. You have to forgive. You, you have to, or suffer in a different way. You have to forgive. Now, coming back after the war, how did that all affect you? Nothing seems to phase on me. I just make the most of what I got, and that's it. I don't have any nerves to speak of, and I guess that's part of living this long. It's, I never did seem to have any nerves. Do you think that's what really got you through all of your experiences? Well, I do think, actually, that a lot of pilots might be dead today because they worried about dying. And I don't think if you're worrying about dying, you're thinking right. You might as well be happy with what you got. You're not going to change it any anyway. Do you think history can repeat itself? And if we don't know about D-Day, that we don't know what could happen next? Like, Oh, yeah. You can't win a war. There's no such thing as winning. It'll keep going and going. Yeah. All the mistakes yeah. are made by human beings, and they do the same thing again. Would, would you do this all again? Meaning, like, would you join the war again and relive this experience? Oh, well, I suppose. I, I wouldn't be quite so eager, <laughs> um, because it'd just destroy a lot of people's lives and and whole countries. 75 years after D-Day, the world faces a chilling possibility, the return of global conflict. And this war will look nothing like the wars of the past. Peter Mansbridge is working on a special documentary. Russia's ability to manipulate elections using cyber trolls is well known. The question is, how might they use it during a war? There are clues in Ukraine. 
In December 2016, in the city of Kiev, the Russians shut down the power grid, sending the city into darkness. It wasn't the first time they'd done it, and it didn't last long, just long enough to send a message. You don't turn the lights on and off in a major city without uh, almost everyone else in the world noticing. Um, so Russia was attempting to signal, I think, to its potential adversaries in the West um, that we have these capabilities, and moreover, we have the resolve to use them. I mean, nobody died uh, in these incidents that we know of, but that's the next step. That's the future of war with Peter Mansbridge tomorrow night on CBC Television at 9 p.m. local, 9.30 in Newfoundland. And on Thursday, the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Join us for a CBC News special starting at 5 a.m. Eastern. You can watch it on CBC Television, CBC News Network, and stream it live on cbcnews.ca and on Jim. But before all that, we are opening up the D-Day conversation to you. I'll take your questions live from Juneau Beach. And we'll talk more about Canada's role in the invasion. Join us for that tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Eastern on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. One more note from London. Coming up, what you did not see during Trump's visit. Larry the Cat, the diplomatic disruptor. But first, back on this side of the pond, from pickup basketball to the NBA Finals, we take a look at Kawhi Leonard's roots in Riverside, California. We want him to know that the second biggest fan base of the Toronto Raptors are in Riverside. Here are some of the stories we're following on The National. A former sheriff's deputy has been arrested in connection to that mass shooting at a Parkland, Florida high school last year. Scott Peterson is facing charges of child neglect and culpable negligence for his lack of action when a gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School last year. We're pleased to see again some accountability for this tragedy that took the life of my daughter and 16 other wonderful people. A surveillance video showed Peterson staying outside while a gunman killed 17 people. If convicted, he could face nearly 100 years in prison. The U.S. has announced major restrictions on citizens traveling to Cuba, banning organized group travel and cruise ship stops. Commercial flights are still allowed. The U.S. State Department says the move is in response to Cuba's destabilizing role in the Western Hemisphere, including supporting the Maduro government in Venezuela. And some stunning video coming out of Arizona tonight after an injured 74-year-old hiker was airlifted out of the Phoenix Mountains. As you can see, though, the rescue did not go as planned. The wash from the rotors causing the stretcher to spin so quickly as the woman was carried away. No word on what injuries the hiker suffered, though she is reported to be in stable condition. Well, game three of the NBA final is set for tomorrow in Oakland, and there can be no doubt that in this showdown, the Toronto Raptors are Canada's team. And Kawhi with the switch. Moves like that by Raptors star Kawhi Leonard have helped set a ratings record in this country. The NBA says a staggering 10.6 million people watched all or part of Game 2. That's an all-time high for the league in Canada. So far, 35% of the population has watched some part of the final. Now, Leonard has become a hero to Raptors fans, but he also has a following where he grew up, near L.A. Kim Brunhuber met some of those fans, including his former high school coach, to see where Leonard's loyalties might really lie. The first day of basketball summer camp at Martin Luther King High School in Riverside, about 90 kilometers east of Los Angeles. Of course, there's talent here, but the next Kawhi Leonard... Oh, my God! Well, that's a long shot. Yes! <laughs> Ready? Go! Jeff Dietz knows coaching an athlete like that only happens once in a lifetime. I just feel real lucky to be just part of a part of it. When Leonard first arrived here, Dietz couldn't have guessed his new student would one day become one of the top five players in the NBA. But he knew Leonard would be a special player because his position on the court was all of them. When you put a kid in on a high school basketball court that can score from all five positions, who can defend all five positions, that. Uh, yeah. As a coach, you kind of just need to get out of the way. 
Pass out, pass out, pass out. Yeah. Kenneth Clayton's brother played on this court with Leonard and told him all about his teammate's legendary work ethic, a lesson that transcends basketball. For me, that's saying that from anywhere and any place, anyone can get better. Now, with Leonard leading the Raptors to the NBA Finals, everyone here is cheering for a team based in another country against a team from their own state. We want him to know that the second biggest fan base of the Toronto Raptors are in Riverside. But for how much longer? Riverside sports columnist Jim Alexander has followed Leonard since high school. With Leonard set to become a free agent this summer, Southern Californians are hoping he will eventually join this pantheon of basketball heroes here at the Staples Center by signing with the Lakers or the Clippers. Do you think he'll end up playing in the stadium behind you? Coming back home to Southern California, that's a powerful lure. But you get back home and then all of a sudden you have all, all your friends bugging you for tickets and whatnot, so I don't know. I don't know, but if I were to guess, my hunch is that he will stay in Toronto. Come on. Good look, good look. And believe it or not, Maurice Jones would be fine with that. Of course, he'd love to see his idol play in LA, but he thinks Leonard should stay in Toronto. Might as well just stay there. That's very unselfish of you. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's always nice to come home, but like, if you're winning titles at a place um, and building a new legacy over there, might as well just stay over there where people love you. Camp is done for the day. Tomorrow night, these kids will be watching and cheering. And Dietz says he hopes somewhere down deep inside, Leonard will feel it. Kawhi on three. Kawhi Ready? Kawhi on three. One, two, three. Kawhi! Kim Huber, CBC News, Riverside, California. Next on the National, an Islander hits a special milestone, one that only 10 other people in this country have achieved. I know it's benefiting somebody. At least I hope it is. We'll tell you about the lifelong commitment that brought him here in our moment. But first. In case you missed it, few on this earth can slow down Donald Trump. But today, the irresistible force met the immovable object. Larry the Cat of Number 10 Downing Street, famous chief mouser for the prime minister and notorious photo bomber, who decided to crash our show earlier, just as we were talking about who might next call it home, up marched Larry, as if to answer that question, even enduring a selfie with a couple of characters from across the pond. So what does any of this have to do with Trump? Well, it turns out Larry may have decided Trump was moving too fast earlier today. He parked himself under the presidential limo and according to some reports, may have trapped it there for a while until he was ready well, ready to move on. That's right, Donald Trump and his bulletproof, bombproof, 10-ton beast, potentially paralyzed by a cat. Can a future in politics be far behind? Ewan Stewart has been reclining in this chair and others like it for the past 68 years, way back in 1951, a co-worker took him to donate blood for the first time. That started a routine that has lasted to this day. Stewart donated for the 1,000th time this day. The staff at his local clinic threw him a party to celebrate, and that is our moment of the day. You ready, Ewan? Yes. <laughs> Congratulations, Ewan. Way to go. You don't mind all the attention? No. I know it's benefiting somebody, or at least I hope it is. I had one experience. I had to go down to the provincial lab, and the, the doctor that was down there, he said, it's for a good friend of yours and a good friend of mine. Three years after that, every time this person met me and he introduced me to somebody, he said, that, that will help save my life, he said. So. Do you plan to just keep coming in and, and making donations as long as you can? Until I'm cut off. <laughs> <laughs> Until I'm cut off. It's a great human story, obviously, Andrew, but, but lots of interesting numbers. I mentioned some of them in the intro. Also, he's 86 years old. There are 11 people in all of Canada, including him, that reached this 1,000 milestone. And the math to get to that number, interesting as well. Yeah, so, so some people might be wondering, how the heck do you hit 1,000 donations, given that, I mean, normally you have to wait a couple months between donations so that your red blood cells can replenish. And so to hit 1,000, you'd have to literally donate for, for a couple of lifetimes. But the secret, plasma. 
You can donate uh, plasma once every week. And so after four decades of donating blood, he decided, hey, let's donate plasma. And so uh, if you donate a thousand times once a week, that should only take you 19 years for those uh, competitive folks out there. That's good national. To know. <laughs> yeah. I know. That's the national for this Tuesday, June 4th. Have a good night. Good night.